Good afternoon. <clears throat> Welcome to the panel on automatic speed enforcement, a very contentious issue in our community. And hopefully this panel will help smooth over some of the edges so everyone can work together and we can get where we need to go. Um, my name is Steve Bingham, and I, I'm going to moderate, but briefly, I come to this work for a specific sad reason. My daughter was killed biking to work in Cleveland in 2009, and that tragic uh, incident caused me to become a, pretty much a full-time street safety activist. Ironically, having been a legal aid lawyer for 23 years, that's one of our offices right across the street, <laughs> Uh, I was one of the very early people dealing with the issue of the inequity of traffic fines and people losing their driver's licenses and not being able to register their cars. And I worked on that for 12 years before getting into uh, this issue. And so I feel I have one foot in each side of this issue, which is we need to slow people down. It's just a just an epidemic of monstrous proportions and yet we need to do it in a way that it doesn't just lead to uh, uh, lots of poor people getting tickets and having their cars towed and not being able to ever drive again so um we're going to begin with uh, brian who is on the oakland privacy commission and he's going to introduce himself and kind of set the frame for the discussion this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you guys for uh, showing up today to weigh in on this uh, very timely issue. Um, you know, I assume most of you live in the East Bay, if not in Oakland. You know, we've certainly seen a, a, a pretty big, a pretty big increase in fatalities involving automobiles, and I'm sure as bicyclists. Uh, I know when I ride my bike around, I'm always like head on a swivel, uh, just not only from the potholes we've got around here, but from, you know, vehicles. Uh, it is dangerous to ride a bike around. We've seen a number of horror stories. I know my, uh, my friend, Supervisor Wilma Chan in Alameda, um, you know, some really, really sad things uh, happening in our society. And so uh, my job as, as chair of a privacy commission in Oakland is... Uh, you know, we've got multiple parts, multiple duties, but primarily what we're supposed to do is serve as an advisory body to the Oakland City Council and to appropriately vet new and emerging technologies and sometimes our existing technologies that we've had for a number of years and try to thread the needle between getting the utility out of it, the good stuff, uh, while mitigating potential harms. Uh, the primary focus on, on the harm side is, is certainly privacy, um, which is kind of a vague, undefined concept um, and certainly subjective in nature. Uh, you know, I might put everything on Facebook. You don't put anything on Facebook, and most people are somewhere in between the two extremes. Uh, we try to look at uh, what is being collected. You know, what is the purpose? Why did you collect this data in the first place? How long are you going to retain it? Uh, are, are third parties getting access to it? As we rely on new technologies, it's almost certainly going to always involve a, a private party, a private vendor. Uh, the, the sort of you know, profit motivation makes a lot of people nervous um, that there might be some you know, nefarious things happening in the shadows. And so what we try to do, um, and I'll, I'll specifically reference Nicole, you know, Oak Dot would bring a, a project to us. She's brought, or her department has brought like a, a license plate reader uh, project to us before uh, to help with parking enforcement. And so we'll look at the vendor they're using, you know, who, who owns the data, who gets access to it, maybe how the appeal process works, efficacy, you know, is it going to even work? And I know that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. Uh, would automated speed enforcement change behavior uh, in a positive manner? That, that's the goal. And someone like me needs to ensure that there's an appropriate use policy with guardrails uh, to mitigate against abuses uh, that might impact negatively impact our civil liberties. What I'll probably focus on a little bit more is sort of our 
a, a subset of our duties when we look at things through an equitable lens. Uh, we, one of the standards in our vetting framework is that the benefits have to outweigh the cost. And the cost is to our, our privacy, to our civil liberties, and also to the taxpayer. And sort of implied within that sort of secondary concern is, you know, disparate impact. Would a bill like this, if it's enacted, which does come with, you know, citations with penalties, is it maybe going to only target, you know, black folks in East Oakland, uh, where a lot of the fatalities are happening, and we're going to, I would assume, put cameras there since we want to change that uh, behavior? Uh, is it going to, you know, really negatively impact lower income folks in, in a manner that's, you know, punitive, that maybe they get trapped in a debt cycle with escalating fees and late fees, and maybe you can't register your car. And, and so we have to think about those consequences as well, even though sort of our primary lens, the driver is really, you know, the privacy impact. As we move into, you know, the, the future, and it's already here, is, is we, we're not just looking at law enforcement. We're looking at smart city applications. Um, you know, we are already using as coordinates. Some of it is ignorance. We're not, we're not turning off certain settings or, or, or controlling our apps in the way that the designer has created for us in response to these concerns. And so these are the questions that we try to, try to act. We have an ordinance, a law in Oakland, uh, which is very similar. There's actually 22 across the country at the city, county levels. And uh, unfortunately, he just walked out. I was gonna give kudos to uh, BART, uh, Director Rayburn, as the first transit district that's also gone this way. Uh, they use a lot of technologies to monitor their platforms and trains and public safety concerns, of course. Um, you know, we've seen a number of quality of life uh, problems, you know, on BART, uh, especially during the pandemic and just, you know, with unsheltered folks and just a lot of the problems that we're seeing. And, and what someone like Nicole would have to do is, is bring us an impact analysis. You know, here's the pros and cons. Here's what we hope will happen if we implement this. Maybe there's a track record of, of success or failures in other jurisdictions that we need to know about. And some of that burden is necessarily going to fall on the Privacy Commission. You know, there's very few cities that have, you know, maybe a privacy lawyer or a data scientist expert on staff, uh, you know, through no fault of their own. It's just not customary. You know, that's a number of larger cities are trying to do like corporations have chief privacy officers and, 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 and privacy offices staff to really help help uh, guide city practices and so we're kind of serving that function we carry some of that burden um, and then ideally we work like we've unanimously been approving so far everything OakDot has, has brought to us um, you know I, I give uh, I'll give him a shout out when he gets back in as, a, as an entire jurisdiction I we rate BART uh, my nonprofit secure justice I do this work all across the country we, we rate BART as the best jurisdiction in the country but OakDot as a department is our highest rated department in the country. They do great work. Um, they've bought in, you know, when, when they bring us documents, you can tell they've already put thought into them. They've already addressed a lot of the concerns even before they come to us. It's been a real pleasure working with them. Um, on, on the more sort of, you know, the, the efficacy side, you know, some things I wanna bring up, you know, up front, especially when it's brand new, there is no track record, right? You just, you, we're making educated guesses. All of us are making educated guesses at this stage. So my own philosophy as chair has been generally, okay, let's, let's trust, you know, let's approve these things up front. But that's why our model does have an annual reporting obligation. It's very robust. Nicole would have to come back to us in a year and say, here's what the new data shows. And that's just to help us constantly make better informed decisions. Maybe something doesn't work and we just wasted a bunch of taxpayer money, so we want to discontinue it. Maybe our retention limit was too short. Nicole actually can't do her job because I'm forcing her to delete data. So we need to amend our policy and change that. That's the types of conversations we have. And then we'll, we're an advisory body only. Our, our real name is actually Privacy Advisory Commission. Uh, we would make recommendations to the council uh, and then the council you know, will ultimately make a decision. Well, we're now going to hear from David Forsa, hopefully, 
who's in Sacramento. Um, he's the he's been a consultant for the transportation committee of the assembly for four years and is an expert on automated speed enforcement and is currently working for author Laura Friedman, who you may all know is also the chair of the transportation committee. And uh, he has helped draft AB 2336, uh, which is the next version after last year's AB 550, which for reasons that will be discussed here, never um, never made it in the law. Uh, so if it works, can we go to David? And David, you can introduce yourself further if you like. That, that can, can everybody hear me or? Yes, yes you can hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. My name is David Sforza. I really appreciate the introduction. Um, just on a, a technical point, I do have a slideshow. Can someone make me the host so I can show the slideshow? Sorry, everyone. Wonderful. Okay, so I, I'm I'm here today to. Can you guys see the slide? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah, make it full screen. It would be better. Yeah. Is it full screen now? No, I guess that's as good as it is. That's close enough. All right. So my name is David Sforza. I, I as as mentioned, I am a consultant for the Assembly Transportation Committee. Uh, I am also staffing this bill for Assemblymember Laura Friedman. Um, and I want to kick, kick it off more starting on why are we doing this? But I, this is a crowd that I don't really need to explain this to. A NTSB estimates that speeding is a factor in 31% of all traffic fatalities between 2005 and 2014, killing over well over 100,000 people. In 2020 alone in California, over 3,800 Californians lost their lives to traffic fatalities, over a thousand of which were pedestrians and cyclists. The speed that a car is going is a dramatic factor on whether or not a pedestrian is gonna survive. A car going 20 miles per hour has a 10% chance of killing a pedestrian versus a car going 40 miles per hour has an 80% chance of killing a pedestrian. Speed cameras have been an effective manner on slowing cars down. The NTSB did a systematic review of 14 uh, studies uh, looking at speed cameras across Canada, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and found reductions uh, in crashes from five to 69%, Injury reductions from 12 to 65 percent, fatality reductions uh, of 17 to 71 percent. Um, other research has also shown a significant decrease um, in, in injuries. The, the picture you're looking at now is New York City's speed camera system that they've had set up for the last few years. These cameras have shown dramatic effects on getting people to slow down. In many intersections, they've seen close to a 90% reduction in the people getting a speeding ticket from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So that, that, that's the why, here's the what. My chair has introduced AB 2336. It authorizes uh, speed cameras in six cities in California for five years, including San Francisco, San Jose, Oakland, Los Angeles, Glendale and a yet to be named Southern California city. Um, the cameras are limited in where they can be placed to 15% of, of the streets that have the highest injuries and fatalities within that jurisdiction. School zones and streets are the high instance of speed racing and motor vehicle exposition of speed, which is sideshows. This pilot is very limited. Uh, New York City has 2,000 cameras. Under this pilot program, Los Angeles 
is going to have 125 systems. A system is two cameras a piece, one going each way in the directions on the road. Uh, San Jose, San Francisco get 33 systems. Oakland gets 18. Glendale is going to get nine. The unnamed city is going to get nine systems. The fines in this bill going on the equity concerns that were raised earlier are significantly less than what the penalties would be today if a law enforcement officer pulled you over for speeding. Uh, this bill provides for a $50 ticket if you're going 11 to 15 miles per hour over the speed limit, $100 from 16 to 25, 26 miles per hour, $200, and a speed greater than, uh, uh, than 100 miles per hour, $500 for the ticket. As you can see, this is significantly less than what a ticket would be if law enforcement pulled you over today. Unlike the tickets uh, by law enforcement, these are going to be civil violations. They're not going to have criminal implications. So beyond these high fines and points that come on your driver's license, this bill will not have points. Because it's a civil violation, if you don't uh, show up to court, you're not going to get a failure to appear a violation. That's a $300 uh, civil assessment added on top of all of these fines. It can result in a driver's license suspension. It can result in a misdemeanor. None of these things are going to happen if we implement this bill and we use speed cameras to enforce the speed limits. These fines might be too high, though, for some individuals. And so this bill tried to take equity into account. If you're on public benefits, which we've defined as indigent, you're going to get an 80% discount on the fines. You're also going to be required to be offered a payment plan for the fines. If you can't pay the fines, you can opt to do community service instead. You're looking at $10, $20, $40, and $100 tickets. If you're 200% above the poverty level, a family of four, making $54,000 a year, you're looking at a $25 ticket for going 11 to 15 miles an hour over the speed limit, 50 and so on and so forth. So we try to design this bill with equity in mind and recognizing that fines uh, and fees can be burdensome and we tried to find a way to reduce them uh, for people that cannot afford them to try to nudge people in, into slowing down. So where does the money go? One of the big criticisms that comes with any of these programs is, oh, this, this isn't for safety. This is for money. And, and there's, there's good reason for that criticism. You, you've seen cities make the mistake of authorizing changes to their speed camera systems in their budget. The city of, of Chicago more recently lowered the speed threshold from 10 miles per hour over the speed limit to six miles per hour over the speed limit to solve a budget shortfall. We don't want that to happen. We don't want cities to be looking at this as a way uh, to raise money. We want cities to look at this as a way to increase safety. So this bill limits what can be used for that fine revenue to enhance safety for road users. The fines have to go to bicycle lanes, road diets, chicanes, chokers, curb extensions, medium islands, roundabouts, traffic circles, speed humps and tables, raised crosswalks, things that are going to have engineering solutions to slowing drivers down, not just giving them tickets. If the city doesn't pay for these things in a three-year time period with the revenue that they're getting, then they lose that money. It's gonna to go to the state and go into the active transportation program. So other cities can bid on projects to build the projects in their city instead. Cities are prohibited from using the fine revenue to backfill their existing expenditure on those items. I'm using language from SB1 that when we gave cities more money um, when that passed. And, and finally, if the speed cameras are not reducing injuries, I'm sorry, are not reducing violations by 25% over an 18 month period, they're gonna have to put up a speed feedback sign where the camera is operated. And they're gonna have to start planning to build any of these things on that street. 
if they want to continue operating the camera. And if the construction hasn't begun within two years, they're not allowed to keep the camera at that location. So who's supporting this bill? We have a large coalition, including the very cities that are part of the pilot. But we also have other cities that are supporting the bill, recognizing the importance of getting this kicked off in California um, include, um, that are not part of this pilot program and would like to be included. We, we have groups like Active San Gabriel Valley, the California Bicycle Coalition. Thank you again for putting this on. Um, uh, safe Streets for All, Streets are for Everyone, Spur. Um, and we also have opposition to this bill, raising some of the concerns that are already raised around equity um, from the ACLU, uh, privacy issues being raised um, by the Electronic Frontier Foundation um, and the ACLU, the Teamsters that are concerned that this is going to result in, in tickets for their drivers, um, as well as groups that that um, frankly, don't see a problem um, with with speeding uh, unless it's excessive uh, 50 miles an hour over the speed limit, like safer streets LA. Um, so I, I think it's important when looking at these, look at besides the equity provisions that are in this bill, what did we do to protect privacy? So we tried to keep these things in mind um, as this bill moves forward. You have to delete the photos and the videos that are created from these cameras within five days if there's no violation captured. To, to link this back to the transit program uh, that the previous speaker alluded to, the state requirement for that is 15 days. So this is a shorter window. It requires the photos and video to be destroyed after 60 days um, of the final adjudication and 120 days for the administrative records. And cities, if they would like to, are allowed to have a shorter timetable and to delete them sooner. They're prohibited from using facial recognition software and using these cameras. In fact, these cameras are generally aimed at taking pictures, um, not of the driver, um, but uh, of the license plate of the vehicle in order to protect the privacy of the individual. Um, which is also one of the reasons why this is a civil program versus a criminal. I also think it's important to remember who's dying on, on, on streets and roads. You, you can bring up the, the equity issues. So let's talk about them. In the city of Los Angeles, African-Americans make up 9% of the population, but 16% of the track fatalities and 14% of the injuries. 43% of all victims that were killed um, looking at, at LA's uh, traffic fatalities were African-American. Um, I'm sorry, were, were killed while, while walking. It, it, it's, it's something that we, we absolutely need to uh, address. And, and I hope that we can continue to work with the opponents of this bill and get this important measure forward. So, so where is it now? The bill passed out of the Assembly Transportation Committee on an 11 to 0 vote with bipartisan support. Uh, there were four abstentions on the bill. On April 19th, the Assembly Privacy and Consumer Protections Committee, uh, chaired by Assemblymember Jesse Gabriel, will be hearing the bill. Um, if the bill passes out of that committee, uh, it will next go to Appropriations Committee. The last day for Appropriations Committee to report bills to the floor is May 20th. We then have until May 27th to get it off the assembly floor. And then the process starts all over again in the Senate. It will likely be double referred in the Senate to Transportation and Judiciary Committee, in which case it has till July to get out of those two committees, August 12th to get out of their Appropriations Committee. It has to be to the governor's desk by the 31st and to um, and, and get a signature by the 30th. But I, I'm focused mostly on that April 19th date right now. So, so how can you help for those of you uh, that are interested in supporting this bill? Reach out to me. Uh, here's my email address and our office phone number. 
I'm happy to have a conversation. If you have concerns about the bill, I'm happy to have a conversation as well to try to talk about it. Um, and I can help walk you through the process and sending support letters for the bill, um, as well as contacting your assembly members and senators on getting them to support the bill. And also you can contact Mark uh, Volk um, Volksevich, who might be in the room with you guys today with Street Sprawl. He's helping put together a coalition letter of, of, uh, of safety groups that are supporting the bill. And I'm looking forward to questions later. Great. Thank you so much, David. That was very informative to set the stage. And now we're going to hear from Nicole, who works with Oakland Department of Transportation and has been interested in this issue for a number of years. I first knew her when she worked at Walk SF. And I'll let you introduce yourself. and. Tell it like it is or no. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm going to walk over to the computer because I have a PowerPoint. Is it okay? I can I can advance my slides myself. That's okay, Dave. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Ferrara. I'm our Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs Advisor at the City of Oakland Department of Transportation. Lovely to see lots of familiar faces and new ones. Um, I'm excited to be here today to talk about safe Oakland. Um, and I, and the um, speed safety system legislation that David uh, very clearly and, and thoroughly outlined. So I might skip over some of my slides. Um, so as I get started, I, I want to just prepare you all that this is um, a, t a presentation about death and it's uncomfortable. So a content warning um, that this it may be uncomfortable. Um, I'm gonna give you a little context on what is happening on Oakland streets. In 2021, 29 people were killed um, due to traffic violence on our streets. And every week, two people are either severely injured or killed on Oakland streets. So I think there's probably about 40 people in this room right now, if you want to just picture all of that. Um, unfortunately, these crashes do not impact our communities equally. Seniors are two times more likely to be killed in a crash than the average Oaklander, and Black Oaklanders are three times more likely to be killed or severely injured while walking compared to the average Oaklander. And behind these statistics are real people with families, like Deontay Bush, who was killed while riding his bicycle around the block from his house on 35th Ave, and his sister, Sherry, who's remain, who remains every day thinking about that loss of life. Or Maisha Singleton, a mother of seven, who was killed while crossing the street on 98th Ave while her kids sat in the car across the street waiting for her. Sorry. <laughs> I think I needed the content warning. <laughs> um, so we must do better. Um, our Safe Oakland Streets initiative is, has three goals. We're, we will prevent serious and fatal injuries from happening on our streets. We are working to eliminate the inequities that exist in these traffic crashes. And three, we need to be conscious and, and intentional about any new equity issues that arise as a result. So I think that is really where, we're, where I want to spend some time talking today. Um, through our SOS work, we analyzed about 70 different um, uh, traffic safety initiatives, and we wanted to uh, understand in our collaborative between the DOT and the Department of Race and Equity and the police department and our city administrator's office, um, how we could advance the most um, F, uh, e uh, sorry, effective strategies that are really going to make a difference in survivability of a crash and think about what are the potential equity impacts and whether or not it's worth it whether we can mitigate those equity impacts or whether 
those equity impacts are just too large to make it worth it. Um, where, where we landed, and you know, this is a very simple outline of about you know, 70 different literature reviews, um, is that engineering is by and large the most effective and critical strategy. And that policy is related, on, uh, related to speed and specifically automated speed enforcement is also highly effective. Um, I think most importantly, when we look at these strategies combined, um, they start to have additive effects. So when you're not just doing one strategy in, an, in isolation where you're combining things, you can really start to make a difference. So today I'll talk mostly about those policy and enforcement strategies, but I would be remiss to share that we are working um, incredibly hard to make engineering improvements day in and day out using as much of our taxpayer dollars as we can get um, based on you know hiring more and more engineers getting more more engineers in our budget to deliver these projects we're delivering projects with quick and effective improvements in in a matter of weeks we're delivering these projects with concrete um, with our own crews with external crews um, we're putting in speed humps on arterials in a fashion that has never been seen in on streets in the Bay Area and trying things out like these left turn traffic calming um, improvements over on Foothill on our high injury corridors. Um, we're building cycle tracks and bike paths um, like this one on MacArthur Boulevard in East Oakland. We're putting in um, huge bulb outs that cut crossing distances by 60% enhanced yielding and um, you know first maybe the first of its kind painted protected intersections but at the end of the day these people are still dying on our streets and there's only so much that we can do to um to deliver these projects as quickly as we can to touch each of our streets as quickly as we can um, and as you heard from david earlier we know that speed has exponential impacts that at 90 or at 40 miles per hour, nine out of 10 pedestrians are killed, but when we are able to cut things down to 20 miles an hour, nine out of 10 pedestrians survive. Um, and in Oakland that's important because one out of four Oaklanders are involved in a, are killed in a crash where speeding is the primary factor. Um, as David shared, we have, you know, speed safety systems are incredibly effective. Um, I'll just highlight the right side where you see the overall decrease in fatalities of 55% in New York City, 39% um, in Maryland, 70% in Washington, DC. Um, that is, that's outstanding results. Um, I wanna shift focus a bit to what this means for um, reimagining public safety and 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 get into a more detailed discussion around um, equity and how this is different. Um, right here, you see our recommendation number fifty-five from the city of Oakland. Sorry, fifty-nine from City of Oakland's Reimagining Public Safety Task Force that charges us with um, moving most traffic enforcement out of the Oakland Police Department and into the Oakland Department of Transportation. And we really see automated speed enforcement as the way to do that. Um, so I'll, I'll give a quick comparison of various speed enforcement strategies. In terms of officer enforced, um, according to our analysis and our literature review, it has limited efficacy in terms of changing behavior. Speed safety systems has high efficacy. Um, we know that there are implicit biases that can lead to more tickets for BIPOC drivers. We see that in our own data that more black and, and brown people are cited um, than, than exist in Oakland, than are involved in crashes in Oakland um, at very high rates. Um, whereas speed safety systems, again, are taking a picture of the rear bumper of that, that vehicle. They are not they're not even capturing a person's face. So there's an opportunity for racial profiling. But I think we do have an important conversation around where these cameras are placed. Um, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, we have high with um, 
impacts on insurance rates, whereas on speed safety systems, you have a low fine of $50, $0 if you're going one to 10 miles over the speed limit, um, $50 if you're going 11 to 15 with fine reduction options that David outlined. Um, officer enforced are obviously police department led tickets. The legislation in front of you um, would require that it, the speed safety systems operate out of um, a department of transportation. Um, and then finally, I think we all know that interactions with law enforcement are stressful and we um, see over and over again instances of these these interactions escalating um, and resulting in um, life and death situations and i think that is probably one of the more um, compelling reasons to use automated speed enforcement where we completely get to eliminate those interactions i think um, you know i i want to just highlight the no enforcement strategy where there is no Efficacy, obviously, and you're not doing anything, so there's no no change happening. But um, I will say, you know, I've been there as an advocate in the land of like, let's just do engineering, let's not even focus on on enforcement. But the more um, the more I see what's happening on our streets, and you know, I think there's unfortunately like people are still dying despite the engineering improvements. You, you visit some of our brand new amazing corridors where we have millions invested and you still see people speeding and going around queues of cars just to get to where they wanna go. And that's the exact behavior that took the life of Myesha Singleton, frankly. And if we can save lives, I think it's worth it. Um, I think, yeah, just, I know, you know, talking to residents in our highest priority neighborhoods, we see the stress that they deal with. Um, I've, you know, had the pleasure of working with, with Steve and others and families for safe streets and just hearing about the loss of life and the impact that that has is, um, it's just, it's really, it's really um, painful to even watch, let alone experience. Um, I think there are really strong equity mitigations within this bill. Uh, we have, you know, there are non-moving violations without focus and we offer, sorry, um, a diversion program, uh, ticket fee reductions between that 50 and 80%. We're working with stakeholders to develop that system use policy, which includes location selection. So I think that's what Okay, I'm gonna try this one. Um, I think that's where the work comes in of really engaging our highest priority communities, engaging our, our citywide advocates in understanding what are the parameters we should be using? Um, where should cameras be located? Take, taking into account individual city um, constraints like for those of you who are familiar with San Francisco, a camera in the Tenderloin where most people don't drive, where you have a lot of commute traffic coming through it is very different from a, a camera in East Oakland where a lot of people are car dependent and where you do have a lot of East Oaklanders driving. So I think being really careful about where we're placing cameras are these maybe locations of regional significance where you have a lot of cut through traffic or et cetera um, is an important consideration. Um, and all of that work really does need to happen at that city level, and that's part of the process that's required in the law. Um, lastly, there's a lot of flexibility and warnings written into this pot, to this bill. So one to 10 miles per hour, you don't even get a ticket. Um, we are, signs are required to alert drivers that a camera is in place. So you're, the goal here is not a gotcha, it's please slow down because people are dying. Um, there's a 30 day warning period when a new camera is put in place um, to give people that opportunity to get used to the camera before, um, before getting penalized. So there's a lot of work that happens before installation. I'm not gonna go through this, but this outlines all the work that goes on before installation and location selection, and then after installation. And frankly, like all of the, the evaluation that happens and the 
you know, we have to actually remove the, the camera if it's not effective after 18 months. So I think there's been a lot of really amazing thought put into, put into this bill. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop talking and pass it back to Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And now we're going to hear from Kevin Chin from Los Angeles. He's the deputy director of the Bike Coalition down there and um, see what this whole discussion looks like down south. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you so much. So LA is going to have the opportunity to put these cameras to the test. Uh, between LA and Glendale, we have over 130 cameras to potentially deploy if uh, if this legislation passes. And in existing conversations with folks in LA, there have been a number of concerns, which, you know, seeing Nicole's presentation, it's uh, as the model for many of the equity concerns, it's nice to see that a lot of things have already been thought through and a lot of things are being addressed in a meaningful way. Um, I think there's, you know, there's still some uh, certain concerns that, that the community still feels uh, that that they you know that, that many community members really are are not sure about just yet. So one, for instance, you know we're certainly asking community members to balance concerns about law enforcement. Many of the black and brown communities in LA are uh, disproportionately impacted um, by by, uh, by their interactions with law enforcement. But we're asking them to benefit uh, to balance those concerns about law enforcement against privacy and then also being able to afford fines. So the, the reduced penalties are great uh, and it's a, it's a step in the right direction, but many of the low income communities that we, you know, that, that we have had conversations with, for them, even a $10 fine is a, is a real struggle and asking those same community members to find time to do uh, community service is a challenge. So it's still, it, it, it is important to have the reduced fines and enforcement is certainly an important aspect, uh, but it's something that I think a lot of folks would, uh, a lot of folks that we, we've worked with would still like to see, you know, other opportunities or other ways in which folks can engage, uh, you know, and, and if they're penalized, be, you know, figure out a way to actually uh, compensate for that. Um, the also, also, the process is important. So uh, I've had the opportunity to live in Washington, D.C., where we saw uh, there was a, you know, a tremendous amount of effectiveness on reducing the number of fatalities. However, even in a system like D.C.'s, there have been a number of problems with it. Oftentimes, uh, when tickets are issued, um, find, you know, the, the, the ticket that's issued doesn't actually get mailed to the right place or the ticket gets lost or something happens along the way. And that actually results in compounded fines if uh, the ticket isn't paid. So there are, you know, process issues are gonna be really important and how we uh, in LA and Glendale will deploy that and how that's gonna actually be, uh, how that will actually be implemented is gonna be really key to making sure that all of these uh, all of these processes for reduced fines and all of these processes for uh, diversion programs, we want to make sure that that's as as low impact and as easy for people to apply for as possible. And we need to make sure that that people are actually getting you know if, if they do get a ticket uh, that they do have um, they do actually receive it. And then. Uh, See, and the last thing I just want to make sure to, to mention is, um, you know, as, as Nicole mentioned, engineering has been shown to be uh, the key and, and one of the most effective ways. And the fact that, you know, we are thrilled to see that the uh, that in this legislation, the way that the legislation is worded, it allows for that money to be spent and focused on engineering. And we want to make sure that uh, it's given to those communities, it's deployed, that engineering is deployed in a meaningful way in those communities where the fines are being generated. But also, uh, it, it's important to make sure that as we're thinking about where those cameras get placed, 
one of the problems that we frequently see in LA is um, you know, wealthier communities have the opportunity to really push against, push back against uh, deployments of these types of enforcement measures. And so we really wanna make sure that uh, we're not disproportionately deploying these cameras only in communities of color where, yes, we are seeing a, a disproportionate impact uh, to those communities, but at the same time, we want to make sure that uh, if communities of color are being disproportionately impacted, uh, but they're not the only ones being impacted, that these cameras get deployed in places uh, where they are needed. Um, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of talk about use of the high injury networks to, de to determine placement of those cameras. Uh, and also, we want to make sure that there are measures in place that prevent, uh, you know, communities that are wealthier from being able to uh, essentially get those, prevent cameras from being deployed in their communities. Uh, I know when the original Bill 550 was, uh, was written, that was one of the concerns that we had was, you know, talking to folks about deploying the cameras around school zones um, and what that would necessarily mean uh, for wealthier communities versus less wealthy communities. So, you know, we're excited for the opportunity to be one of the pilot uh, cities for this legislation if it is passed. Uh, and we see this as a way for us to, you know, explore some of these challenges and make sure that uh, if we're going to move forward uh, with a more automated enforcement, uh, you know, automated enforcement setup, that we do it in the right way and that we have the opportunity to really work closely with the communities to make sure that the most impacted communities are impacted in a positive way, that we're not actually creating new uh, burdens for those communities, and also making sure that uh, those communities see the most benefits out of the funds that are generated by this legislation. Okay, thank you, Kevin. And now, before all the benefits of this bill and actually remarkable progress since the concept was first put forward in terms of addressing equity concerns both around and privacy concerns um, but we're not there yet there's still problems and so i'm going to turn it back to kevin to kind of close this session just in terms of to brian to close the session in terms of privacy issues particularly, but also other equity issues. And then we're gonna open it to the floor for questions and also ideas that you may have. I have several, um, how we can get there so that uh, these two forces can come together for a desperately needed technology. So, right. Thank you. And uh, I'm just going to start off with a couple of house cleaning items real quick. Director Rayburn walked out of the room earlier, but uh, I was publicly congratulating BART, been our, uh, my nonprofit Secure Justice's highest rated jurisdiction in the country, two years in a row, uh, complying with your own surveillance ordinance uh, obligations. So I, I hope you guys are all BART customers as well. Um, tonight, our Privacy Commission happens to be meeting at 5 p.m. virtually. Um, and although we will not be voting, it's just going to be a little informational chat. Uh, the lobbyist for the opposition of this state bill is going to just share some of his concerns with us. Nicole may, you know, participate or, or may just observe, but um, she's going to bring the actual proposal to us uh, May 5. Uh, so on May 5, uh, if you want to show up, the agenda should be on the city's website, or you could just email me if you want it, and I'll give it to you, brian with an I, brian.hofer at gmail.com, and I'll just send it to you, and you can access it by Zoom if you want to weigh in. Um, most of you probably are up to speed, but just in case some aren't, this has been a two-year effort, and so a lot of what we just heard, and I was privately whispering to Nicole, I actually just learned some new things. Uh, that I was unaware of um, that hadn't been addressed in last year's version. And so it is correct, as Kevin and others have just said, that a lot of mitigation effort has happened uh, in that two-year uh, time period. Um, when Nicole comes to us in earnest in May, 
uh, part of our framework, which is actually pretty unique to Oakland, we, we require the, the contract as well, not just the use policy. Um, when we're involving private vendors, we want to see who owns the data. If my memory is correct, I think OCDOT is the only department in the country I've never had the fight over ownership of data. They just knew right away, like, you know, it's going to be Oakland's data. I mean, yes, the private party is going to have to, you know, interact with it and access it to, to function for the technology to function, but they can't, you know, go monetize it and sell it out to third parties. And so that's one critical piece we're going to still look at. The, the, the location choice is going to be probably pretty big in Oakland. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's always an, an interesting part for me intellectually because, you know, it's like when I talk to police specifically, they're like, well, we go here because that's where the crime is. I'm like, yeah, but you're always going to that block and it's always black people. And yet, if your data is showing you that, you know, 90% of these accidents are, are happening, you know, fat fatal accidents are happening at this one intersection, it's like, it is reasonable that we have to go to that location and address it. And there may be a tension there. And that's what the Privacy Commission needs to do is, is try to uh, address that for real um, and, and, and create either a guardrail or some sort of mitigative step um, to lessen the impact right up front. We also have to just be mindful this is new. Um, as I stated earlier, to me, I generally will probably vote yes on anything the first time we see it and be a little bit more critical during the annual review period once we actually have our own Oakland track record to examine, is it working? Um, when Nicole shared earlier that their own data is showing BPOC people getting most of the citations, um, I've looked at racial stop data for both Berkeley and Oakland, it's horrible. It's nowhere even close to matching the demographics in those respective cities. <clears throat> so there is clearly um, and, and a lot of that racial stop data, I should have made more clear, a lot of that was collected uh, via license plates. It is clear that technology, um, you know, it doesn't live in a vacuum. The tech itself may be race neutral, but the humans are still involved with it, right? If we're going to select the camera choice, that is a human decision, not the camera decision. Um, and, and so those are the questions we're going to be asking um, in earnest in May when this comes forward. And I imagine they're also, uh, you know, weighing in at the state. Uh, committee level, and I just do want to encourage you folks, um, all these mitigating steps are happening because people spoke up, because people did engage the office office, they did write opposition letters, they do talk to their elected officials, and so we're making it better work product, you know, so I, I want to encourage you to get engaged if you're not already, uh, you know, you may not love the final idea, but it will be less bad. You know, that's, that's the minimum, and you might actually end up supporting it, and um, we get to realize the benefits of it, and, and that's going to be an exciting thing if it works out as we hope it will. Yeah, thank you, Brian. So we'll open it up, and I'm actually going to open up with one question challenge, and hopefully there will be some other questions like this. So having worked on these uh, fine fees equity issues for 10 or 12 years. The thing that just struck me has to go in the bill, and I did actually talk to David Forsett about it. I don't know if he's still listening, but if you don't pay your fine, um, they notify DMV, and DMV won't let you register your car. This is a huge issue all over the state. And as I think it was maybe Kevin pointed out, mail delivery problems for people who are poor are pretty awful. And it's very common uh, for people not to get their mail. So that's one issue that's out there that needs somehow to be addressed. But, and maybe someone has an I, answer to that. But I, uh, I, I do, know. if you guys can still hear me. Uh, for the floor to ask questions or make comments. And I think David is going to- I'll moderate. Talk. And we're going to start, we'll take your questions verbally here. You can raise your hand, but we have a question through the app. So just to encourage you to use the app uh, over the next day or so. The question is, uh, and I'm going to reword the question just a little bit, but like, what do we know about people who are speeding in say Oakland, in LA? What do we expect the data to show us 
if the cameras are deployed geographically, at least equitably, or equitably based on the high injury network. What do we know now about those people is the question that we have online. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, I was involved tangentially in an, an analysis. This is not data we typically analyze, um, but I was involved when I was at Walk SF. SF um, did analyze who's speeding and who's kind of at the wheel. Um, largely, it's males. Um, uh, I Man, this is going back in my brain, but I think it was largely white males. Um, and <laughs> I think from, honestly, I think it was from wealthier parts of the Bay Area, from the South Bay, from Marin, um, from the west side of San Francisco. But I, again, I'm not really authorized to talk about that data because I was really tangentially involved. Um, the in Oakland, we know who's involved. We looked at who's involved in crashes and we compared that to who's getting citations. And um, that could be someone involved uh, behind the wheel or as a victim. And we saw that still um, black people were disproportionately impacted by tickets. Um, about 33% of black Oaklanders are involved in a crash. Um, about 44% are receiving tickets, or, or sorry, about they receive about Black Oaklanders, 44% of Black Oaklanders receive tickets, but about 23% of Oaklanders are Black. So kind of see those escalating impacts. So about tw two times the population are receiving tickets right now from traditional enforcement me methods. So I don't have the numbers uh, for LA readily available, but what I will say is I would be surprised if they were that dramatically different from the numbers that uh, Nicole just shared. Um, but one thing I do want to point out is that, uh, especially for LA and LA County, one of the biggest challenges that we have of actually collecting that data is it's, uh, it's actually self-reported by the police officer who makes the, uh, who makes the stop. And so, for that data, uh, oftentimes it is not 100% precise and it's not 100% accurate. And it really, there, you know, there's a whole gamut of possibilities for how that data can be skewed or mis, uh, misconstrued or otherwise misrepresent uh, the individual who is being stopped. And so I think, you know, as important as that data is, uh, we do need to be careful about, you know, how how disaggregated, uh, how disaggregated that data is and how we actually do the collection of that data in a meaningful way. Uh, but, you know, if we're looking at locales where police are deployed, again, the general tendency is for them to be deployed in black and brown communities. Uh, and most many of the stops are taking place in black and brown communities. And in LA in particular, uh, we see a lot of the, uh, the generation of tickets uh, coming out of those black and brown communities as well. So um, as important as that, as important it is to know who is speeding, um, what we're, you know, I think what we're, what we would love to be able to see is uh, focus on uh, why people are speeding and what is actually causing uh, people to speed. Um, you know, we see, a, we see it a lot, you know, I live in the city of Long Beach. Uh, we see it a lot for people who are driving from Orange County through Long Beach to get to jobs in the city of LA. Uh, and there are certain uh, thoroughfares that have particularly high impact on POC communities, but also uh, they are basically could have a potential positive impact and what the potential pitfalls might be in order to make sure that we're not, again, disproportionately negatively impacting the communities that live in those areas. All right, thanks. We'll take your questions now. I'll call on you. Go ahead and state your question. I'll ask the panelists to repeat the question just to make sure everyone hears it before you give your answer. Uh, Warren, I'll start with you over there.
like I just explained, the panelists are going to repeat the question so you can hear it, okay? <laughs> Warren, hold your hold your second question. Let's let's start with that one. Sure. So the question is, uh, the speed uh, at which the tickets can be issued is it is it eleven miles over the posted speed limit or the eleven miles over the eighty fifth percentile? And so, from my personal experience in Washington D.C., it's over the posted speed limit and not based on the eighty fifth percentile. And so I don't know what it would necessarily be in Oakland. Yeah, you would need to do a speed survey using the 85th percentile and taking the appropriate reductions from the 85th percentile to post the speed limit. So it's both, it's both in, yeah. Okay, thanks. And I'm gonna change my mind in mid-sentence since Warren asked a long question, but a good one. I'm just gonna hand the mic to y'all. Uh, this is a question for David. Has there been any modeling or estimate about how much money would be collected and, and devoted towards street safety improvements in the various municipalities? Thanks. There is not. I, I think actually good. Can you guys hear me? If you could speak up, that would be great. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to speak up. Um, there has not been a modeling. No, the, I mean, it's been, there's been a lot of tickets issued in New York City, but actually going back to the previous example, New York City has a 25 miles per hour speed limit across the entire city, whereas California does still base its speed limit on the 85th percentile with some deviations allowed. And so I, I don't imagine you would see the same number of ticketing in California as you would in New York City. And New York City has 2000 cameras uh, the most any city will have is Los Angeles with 125 cameras, and they get more cameras because they see more death. Uh, there's a, a they saw 269 fatalities last year compared to Oakland's um, 40. No. Okay, that works now. Great. Thanks. Um, so I'm, you know, I remember hearing back when it was just like a San Jose, San Francisco pilot years ago, four or five years ago, it's really evolved a lot in terms of especially the equity components. I really appreciate that. Um, I mean, I think that it's really important to distinguish between kind of this like super misanthropic, like driving 30 miles an hour over the speed limit. And then just roads where people are constantly going 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. And we know that speed kills, right? That like, and so a road where everyone is going 10 miles an hour over the posted speed limit may actually be a more dangerous road than a road where every once in a while someone's going 35 miles an hour over the speed limit. We don't know, I think is the answer. And one question I have is, you know, there are all these uh, restrictions on how long you keep the data for privacy considerations. I'm wondering, if there's a logging in the system that can be kept over time, not the license plate readers, but of, car, of how fast cars are going generally, it can be looked at over time because if consistently a roadway is having users going 10 miles an hour over the speed limit, those users aren't being ticketed. Personally, I'm okay with that, but those are the roadways where we really need infrastructural changes. And so I'm wondering whether that's built into the bill whether it's something that can be done with the technology, I don't even know. I'm wondering if you can address that. Or someone, I don't know who would address that best. I, I think that would involve a lot more monitoring that some of the privacy groups would be comfortable with if you're repeatedly capturing the speeds that everyone's going if they're not having a violation captured. 
but I, I don't want to speak for the privacy groups, but I imagine that would be a concern raised with having that type of monitoring. And there's other technologies that could do that that don't have the video evidence. The feed uh, speed feedback lo loops can capture the speeds that cars are going. I'll I'll, I'll take a stab at this a little bit, um, and I don't know specifically that it's going to come up in Oakland. But so my nonprofit, Secure Justice, we haven't taken a position on this bill, and I doubt we will at all. We'll probably just sit out. But in Oakland. Um, and specifically with Oak Dot on other uh, proposals that they brought before us. Um, I'm this very weird hybrid of super aggressive privacy activist and also guy that wants to rely on data and see what the real lay of the land is. And so what we've done, um, which some privacy groups don't agree with, um, we have actually collected certain data, like I believe you're suggesting, and what We've drawn a line in a couple different places, but the, the short answer is if it's in the aggregate and we could just sort of look without any PII, personally identifying information, um, but try to get the answer that you're talking about, I've always been comfortable with that. Um, and so, you know, I, I kind of agree with David, like that's a big bite to take off at this maybe kind of late stage since the bill's already drawing in, but that probably is something we'd look at at the local level in Oakland. Hi, um, I just want to speak to the disparate um, practice of um, ticketing in primarily black and brown communities as opposed to white communities. So my community in Santa Fe, which also borders um, uh, the Bushrod neighborhood in North Oakland, uh, between, it's first of all, it's the widest street in District 1. It's six lanes, three in either direction with a median in between. Um, my neighborhood has changed dramatically in terms of demographics. I call the police constantly about speeding. So there is nine blocks between 55th Street and the Berkeley border. And people are going, I mean, it's like the Indy 500. We never get anybody, never get OPD to come out and do ticketing. We can't even cross our street. There's a senior citizen uh, building uh, center across the street. Seniors can't get over there. Um, and we can't get any enforcement at all. I mean, we could probably fund the entire uh, Oakland Police Department if they gave tickets over there. I mean, it's, it's really that bad. So what can we do about that, Nicole? <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. Well, that might be a good location for a speed camera if we can pass this legislation. So it might be a good opportunity for you to weigh in and um, I see Mark. Where's Mark? There, Mark's right there. Um, and Mark is with Streets for All, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and collecting uh, signatures from folks and sign-ons for a letter that he's been working to d develop from advocates. So um, I would encourage you to talk with Mark and talk with me some more. Happy to connect you as well to um, various state state uh, assembly members. Can I just add one word and just for us to continually think about it. It's also an example of how it's important to think infrastructure at the same time that we think speed cameras. The work that I've done, the people who are fine fees activists constantly say, why don't you do traffic calming and all that? And we are doing that, but we need to do more of that. And a street that has six lanes probably shouldn't exist. You get rid of two lanes on each side and make bike lanes, protected bike lanes. I should mention that planning project is underway. <laughs> Charlie over there is probably working on it. <laughs>
They love. Okay. Um, so it seems to me that in terms of um, location of cameras, for example, and whatever the potential inequities of the data that might come out of it, right? Because if we put the cameras in certain places, then that's what it's going to be measuring, right? So it seems to me that there's going to be plenty of parallel situations between you say, well, here's a high injury location. We're going to put a, pair, a camera there. Let's find an, another place in the city that's engineered in a similar way. So at least has some kind of a, a, a balance there. So that we're, we're comparing two things that are somewhat like. And then the other thing I would think is that um, potentially part of what's, dis what's upsetting the measurements to some degree is that there may be neighborhoods in which there's a lot more people who are necessarily pedestrians right and that that there's a, might be a lot of high high vehicle high speed vehicle movement in places where there's just fewer people on the street and therefore they're not getting as many is that right am i completely off track there um because i think that it's really important to get this right around what are we looking at when we look at the data right and so maybe somebody could speak to that who's better informed than i am I'll take a stab at it. I think ultimately we're looking at where are we, where can we put this to reduce the number of people dying and being severely injured. Um, there might be streets where people are speeding, but people aren't dying. And I think we need to put it where people are dying because we have 18 opportunities in the city of Oakland. Um, so, but that is all part of that use policy. So I, I just want to add to that that um, you know your your point is well taken, but uh, one of the challenges that often comes from looking at the parallels of engineering is that you're going to find, generally speaking, the the worst streets tend to be in those poor neighborhoods to begin with, and so finding a parallel street in a less you know less poor neighborhood or a wealthier neighborhood may be actually be a challenge to find something that uh, that accurately represents a comparison point. So I know, you know, in the city of LA, we oftentimes have that challenge where, um, and, and, you know, part of it is, is, is also, there's been this history of redlining that has happened that makes it so that many of those streets are engineered specifically through uh, black and brown neighborhoods. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, trying to find that parallel in a non-black and brown neighborhood may be a challenge. So it's something, it's an interesting thought and, and I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, and it, yeah, I think it would be something to look at as we, you know, especially as LA gets the opportunity to implement it. Um, maybe it's not something that we can look to encourage our uh, Department of Transportation to look into. I'll just quickly add, and I can't speak to the state bill on this part, but in Oakland and anyone operating under the same uh, surveillance vetting framework, that question is going to be answered both during the upfront stage and the impact analysis and the annual report. Uh, we get the benefit with an impact analysis up front of getting a baseline of data. The apples to apples comparison is, is critical. It's often very difficult to achieve. Um, but hopefully then on the back end when that annual report comes due, we're going to ask all those questions and we're going to check those variables. You know, it's a personal source of frustration for me. Uh, I just co-wrote uh, Alameda's license plate reader policy yesterday. It's a wonderful policy, and I also told them it's completely useless. They have no ability to gauge whether or not the technology is useful in actually achieving its stated goal. They have no baseline of data. So when next year shows they recovered 30 stolen vehicles, it's meaningless because they don't know what they did the year before. And so those are the, we do solve those issues in Oakland under this framework. We're going to ask Nicole, what are your statistics today? And then when she comes back next year, and we do account, you know, I've got data scientists and folks on my own team that we look through these things um, separately from the Privacy Commission and go, okay, control for variables also. Some years there's more crime, other years less crime, and, you know, you need to account for that. And we do, and we'll, we'll be looking at that in earnest in Oakland. This question is about the requirement to spend the collected money at the location of the camera. 
it seems to me like that could burden what's already going to be a tough conversation. Like not only are you guys going to get a camera, but we're also going to be back in a few years to take all your parking away here and, and rip the street up. Also, it could mean that overly restrictive elements like that rule can make it hard for cities like Oakland to effectively spend that money. So maybe this is a question for David. Could you talk more about that rule and about any accommodations that you're making for cities to flexibly use that money and make sure that we can actually spend it in the way that it was meant to? Yeah, so first, that rule only kicks in if the camera's failing to decrease speeding by 25%. So the, the, they don't have to spend at that location if the camera has not, uh, um, if the camera has successfully gotten 25% reductions in speeding. I showed you data from New York City. They had intersections where there was a 90% reduction um, in the number of tickets issued. That trigger is supposed to come in to show that the, they put the camera in a location that the camera is not being effective. It's not slowing down. We're not achieving the results we want to achieve. And you're going to have to do some engineering work if you want to achieve the results you want to achieve because the camera is not uh, by itself. It's not doing it. Can I just interrupt real quick? David, and I apologize, I'm not up to speed on this year's uh, draft. Does engineering, could it include alternatives, subsidizing public transit, protected bike lanes, getting people out of cars in the first place? Bike lanes are included. Yeah, hi. Uh, up in Eugene, Oregon, where my son lives, uh, two main streets, 6th and 7th Avenue, east and west, they instantly reduced the speed to 20 miles per hour, per hour. And the kicker there is they're both one-way streets going each way. They synchronize the traffic lights. No cameras, no enforcement. Absolutely successful in bringing the speed down. When I was in France last, going from a rural 90K an hour to 40 into a village, there's a light up there. If you're approaching it much over that 40K, it turns red. No enforcement needed, no cameras, and quite successful in getting the speed down. So maybe these are things that could be looked at in the future when you generate some money from, from this bill to uh, try to reduce speed that way, because these are going to be very effective. Yeah, having uh, gone to France almost every year to visit my wife's family, I can sort of second that in terms of France. And it is important to look at what other countries are doing. Seven or eight years ago, France decided that the speed limit was the speed limit. And I got two tickets driving that summer going one kilometer over the speed limit. And obviously I was furious, but you know what? They have reduced crashes very, very dramatically by that. So one of the things that's a side issue that we have to look at is this concept that you can just speed over the speed limit and speed limit doesn't mean speed limit because if you don't have a bright line then if it's 10 to 11 versus 11 to 15 or whatever people are pushing it i do it i suspect almost everyone in the room who drives goes over the speed limit and uh, um it's um i mean they certainly use enforcement but and they use speed cameras to do it, but boy, did they let the French know for a year ahead of time um, that it was coming. So one of the important parts of this bill is that it does notify communities about the bill, the speed cameras coming in, where they're gonna come in. Um, so that element as cities bring this online is a critical element in terms of getting buy-in from the community. All right, our final question, a tough hitting question. Uh, I think it's going to be for Nicole, but I, Brian, you may also want to weigh in on this. Uh, as Nicole stated, infrastructure can't, and this is online, encouraging you all to use your app. As Nicole stated, infrastructure can't solve everything, but Oakland has only just reached the tip of the iceberg of what could be accomplished with infrastructure. Given OCOT's resource constraints, would a speed camera enforcement program be more effective at improving safety compared to applying those same OCOT staff resources to other units? Um, I think it's a both and. I, I think 
there's so many benefits of infrastructure improvements beyond um, traffic safety around health and livability and um, neighborhood vibrancy that we we certainly wouldn't want to pull any of that back climate sustainability etc and in order to reach those goals we also need to make our streets safe enough so that people feel comfortable using them mm -hmm. uh, brian so let's say a year from now you're reviewing the program and oak dot is saying things like yeah we haven't gotten the speeds down enough and, but we don't have enough resources to get in there and fix the street just yet. Would your perspective be to give them more time or, or if there was an equity issue to give them more time to work that out? Or would you come in, you know, one year or whatever and kind of evaluate that a little more closely? I mean, I guess it depends on the degree of success they could show. You know, if it's a 1% reduction and we got to wait five more years to re-engineer our roads, probably not going to be that you know excited about continuing the project if 25 is the threshold and they're at 23 percent that's pretty good um we would probably say okay let's let's go another year and and, and see if we get there i think that's it steve well thank you all for coming and thank you panelists